Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's always a joy of mine to learn something every day that I live. Yesterday I learned something. I want to share it with you. I actually learned two things yesterday. I'll share them both with you. I learned how long it's been since it, since it rained, I mean since the sunshine, and I learned that Christmas cards are not effective on July on January the 5th. They would be less effective on July the 5th, wouldn't they? Yeah, I was driving home yesterday and the sun came out and I needed my visor. Apparently, for the first time since I stuck that Christmas card up there and it landed in my lap. Needless to say, my wife was not as thrilled with it yesterday as perhaps she would have been on Christmas, right? It's been a while since the sunshine. It looks good out there, doesn't it? I'm in the book of Luke, maybe Luke chapter, I don't know, start in chapter 6, we're going to chapter 8. It's a new year, a new topic, new theme, new direction for me, and so as I began that this morning, I'll take just a moment to kind of set up this year of study for us together. I've read and heard about the parables of Jesus all my life. Most of them you and I would recognize in the pages of Scripture. I've never studied them. That is, in depth, to try to understand the meaning and to solidify the teaching that is behind them. And so I'm excited about this year of study, Lord willing. I chose the book of Luke to go through the parables. Obviously, I could have chose Matthew or Mark and done just as well, but chose the book of Luke to look at the parables of Jesus that Luke shares with us along the way. And then on Sunday evenings, what I hope we can do is dive into some questions and into some deeper study of these parables. Perhaps you already know that a parable is simply a comparison of a simple fact. That would be what is spoken it is a comparison of a simple fact to a spiritual truth. And oftentimes those spiritual truths are, are unspoken. They're unmentioned. They're left for mine and your interpretation and application thereof. And so as we study together this year, I hope if you're not already making Sunday night a priority for your life, I hope you'll do that. As we introduce the parable, if you will, on Sunday mornings and try to discover some of the stated simple facts, and then on Sunday evenings as we try to dive deeper into those, more in a Bible class type format of question and answer type discussion time of what are the spiritual truths, some of which may be spoken, some of which may be unspoken as we try to gain application. And so as you look on your family news, you'll see some questions there as they relate to the use of parables or to the method of parables, if you will, and that's kind of where we start this morning. What are parables? Well, very commonly, they would be classified as similes. That is, using the term like or as. So, very simple parables would be things like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then it would proceed from there. And so those tend to be a little easier to grasp. Some parables are long and extended. Some parables are very brief. For example, are you there in Luke chapter 6 and verse 39? Here's the parable. Can a man lead, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? There's the parable. That, that's all that was said in relation to that. And so then you began to ask yourself, well, what is the meaning? What is the application? What is Jesus trying to teach? He's using something very common among mankind, a blind man. We all know what 
blind people, how they get around and maneuver. One of my favorite memories as a kid is the blind preacher. And he would literally have to have somebody. I remember him traveling around. I don't remember his name. But I remember him traveling around and speaking all over the area down in Mississippi. And somebody would lead him up to the podium and he would, he would grab it. And then as a kid, I always looked forward to the guy on the front pew saying, 25, because that meant he had five minutes left, right? He didn't know what time it was. He didn't know how long he... We, we understand blind people, don't we? It's a common thing in our society, and it was in theirs. And so how does that simple fact of everyday common life translate into some spiritual truth and obviously in Luke 6 and verse 39, Jesus, Jesus again just stays very practical, very simple-minded. If a blind person leads a blind person, won't they both end up in a ditch? And he doesn't give any spiritual implication in what He says there, but rather He wants them to ponder, to consider to meditate upon what he said there. So some are long, some are very short and straightforward. Some are almost like extended stories. For example, the, the Samaritan man who, you might recall, helped the man that had fell among robbers and thieves and left for dead on the road down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's a parable. Well, what is that parable? Or maybe it's the, we call him the prodigal son. That's a parable. It's a long parable. What is that teaching us about the man with his father there? And so, as we go through these, there are many of them. And there are a lot of spiritual teaching. I began this morning in Luke chapter 8. Jesus tells this parable here, a very common one, and one that we're going to deal with fairly quickly, beginning in verse 4, about a sower. And we'll look at this parable in the coming Sundays, Lord willing. And he tells that parable about that sower. And in verse 9, he, he tells the parable, and then the disciples ask him, what does this parable mean? And Jesus says in verse 10, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables. So that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. It's from those two verses then that we want to study this morning to ask ourselves, what is the purpose or what is the use or what is the method behind parables? If you're looking for parallel passages, and I'll try to give these to you throughout the year, parallel passages would be Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 10, the Bible tells us that the disciples were alone with Jesus when they asked this question. If you're looking for the parallel in Matthew's account, and some of them won't have parallels necessarily, but Matthew does have a parallel account in Matthew 13. We'll look at that a little greater tonight, Lord willing, as we continue to study the use of parables. We'll flip over to Matthew 13 and look at what Jesus gave a lot longer explanation of his reason than he did in Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, in verse 10, he just says, okay, there's two types of people. To you, it has been given to know the secrets, or maybe your Bible says the mysteries of the kingdom. But to others, it's told in parables. The first thing we learn from Luke chapter 8 and verse 10 is that there are two types of people in the world. If you look at it at face value, what you might begin to conclude very inaccurately is that God has specifically chosen some people to reveal some specific divine spiritual truths to, and He kept it hidden to others, and that's not the case at all. 
In other words, to this other group over here, we're going to couch it in parables so that they won't see the real meaning, they won't get the real meaning, they'll miss the message, and that is so inaccurate. What is accurate is that there are two types of people. What's accurate is some understand the secrets or the mysteries of the kingdom. Now that's group one. When we begin to think about this idea of mystery, obviously we think about mysteries in terms of things that are uh, spooky and things that are unknown and the dark hallways and what's behind the closed door and all of that. The the Bible, as a matter of fact, if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, that's not even the first definition of the word mystery. And the Bible doesn't use the term mystery that way. The very first definition in Webster's Dictionary of the word mystery is a spiritual truth that is capsulated in such a way as to be hidden from certain people. A spiritual truth, a mystery. And oftentimes that's what parables are doing. They have this heavenly meaning, but it is couched in, it is hidden, it is capsulated in a very earthly, simple, physical, everyday, common occurrence for the people of the first century. Now, Please catch that last phrase because it might not be something that's common in our society today. And, and, and we'll have to deal with that and dissect that and interpret that to try to understand it if it's not the case. But for them, it was something they didn't have to interpret what the parable was saying because it was so simple and common to them. And most of them will be for us as well. And so... The deal is, is this heavenly meaning being wrapped in this earthly package becomes a mystery to some, a secret of sorts to some. But this is not the first occasion. No, did you, did you follow Doug in Isaiah chapter 5? God's been using parables for a long time. He used it with the prophets. Isaiah told a parable in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Did you catch it? There's a vineyard, and God planted a vineyard in this city. And what he wanted from the vineyard was he wanted grapes. That's why you plant a vineyard. Did you catch what Isaiah said? God actually got wild grapes. And then as you get down to the end of that lengthy parable there in Isaiah 5, God says, Jerusalem, the vineyard that I would plant, and look at what you've done. All we can do now is go in and destroy you. We'll just make you a heap of ruins. Briars will come up. Thorns will come up. I'll tell the clouds not to rain. And good luck raising any type of grapes in your vineyard because you're not going to have any water and you're going to have a bunch of briars and thistles. It's a parable. It is a earthly message with a heavenly meaning. It's a parable. And God's been using parables for years before Jesus. Obviously, Jesus used parables to help with the mysteries of the kingdom. When you come over to the book of Revelation, you think about the idea of mystery. It is that symbolic meaning. You know, you, you read the word mystery. It's only used a few times in the, in the New Testament. And a half of those times is found in the book of Revelation. And when you get there and you understand the book and you understand why God would choose the word through the Holy Spirit, mystery. He's saying, listen, this is symbolic. This is hidden, obviously in that context, hidden from the Romans. Hidden from the Roman emperor and the Roman empire. And so there was a purpose behind the, the mystery, if you will. Jesus says to those disciples that ask Him, what, are, what is the purpose of parables? 
He says to you, you're in the first group. You are the group that get it. You see it. You understand it because you have been given the secrets to the mysteries of the kingdom. But now there's a, another group over here. And this other group, they don't get it. They don't understand it. They don't see it. Why, why don't they? And if you just stop there, it's almost like God doesn't want them to. But Jesus goes on in Luke chapter 8 and verse 10. And He says, Oh, they see it, but they don't. Oh, they hear it, but they don't understand it. And I'll just tell you very briefly, there's a, there's a, a contextual issue going on here in debate among scholars about whether it's because they don't or in order that they don't. And you say, well, what difference does it really make? Well, if, if it's because of something, then it's their choice. If it's in order that something be accomplished, then it's God's choice. And therefore, we have a doctrinal debate going on here that's in the minds of the grammatical scholars. And I'm just telling you that it's both. It's both. That's where I stand on a lot of debates. It's both. It's because of, in order that, God's will be accomplished. It's because of what? It's because of their hearts that they refuse to see and to understand. Now, God didn't make that choice for them. Please, don't misunderstand that. God is willing that all would see that all would understand. God wants everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth and therefore be saved from their sins so that they might not perish. Don't ever confuse that. The, these people that are not seeing or understanding is not the result of something that God is doing in order that He might accomplish His purpose it is because they refuse in order that <coughs> excuse me God's purpose might be accomplished. It is by their choice that when Jesus tells the parable they close their ears and close their eyes to the deeper spiritual meaning in order to keep it just very basic, very fundamental, very applicable to everyday life. Because if they begin to dig deeper, they'll have to make some changes to how they live. Now, it may be a shameless plug, but it's a plug nonetheless, and I'm admitting it to you right out of the gate. If you want to go deeper into these parables, you might have to change your behavior and lifestyle to come back on Sunday nights. These people refused to do that. They refused to go deeper and therefore seeing they could not see and hearing they could not understand because they chose not to. Ultimately, what parables do is they separate an open heart from a hard heart. The words of Jesus, the teachings of the parables will separate these two groups into those disciples that Jesus said, you have been given the secrets of the kingdom. Not because they were special, not because they were in some particular uh, position to be uh, divinely appointed, although the apostles were. I'm not discounting that. But these disciples were willing to make the choice to understand what Jesus was trying to say. And therefore, because of the openness of their hearts, were able to see into the parables on a deeper level. Whereas the other group 
who only saw the parable was the group who had closed their hearts for whatever reason, being hostile toward Jesus and the other Christians. I mean, if you don't believe that they didn't exist, go back to chapter 5 and verse 21. The scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They're already ridiculing Jesus. They're already hostile toward the message of Jesus as the Son of God, the one who could forgive. Look at verse 30. I'm still in chapter 5. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at His disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with sinners? I'm in chapter 6 and verse 2. Some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus, how do you let you guys go and gather grain on the Sabbath? It's not lawful. It's these people then in chapter 8 and verse 10 who see the parable. And that's all they see. Because they have chosen within their heart to refuse to open up and to go deeper and to understand greater the message of Jesus. And therefore... Seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not understand. And it's a quote. It's a modified, shortened quote. Matthew 13 tonight, Lord willing, will give the longer quote from Isaiah chapter 6. And in case you're wondering, I still know how to count. And Isaiah 6 comes right after Isaiah 5. Right? the parable of the vineyard, and then God says in Isaiah 6, look at my people. I planted a vineyard. I wanted grapes. And what I'm getting is wild grapes because look at my people. It's in Isaiah 6 that God is saying to Isaiah, I want you to go to those people. Or I need somebody to go. And Isaiah says, Here am I. Send me. Well, Isaiah, let me tell you about these people that you're going to. There are people much like the scribes and Pharisees in that they're hostile toward me, God, and, and they don't want to open up and accept. Parables. Why use Parables i tell you why Jesus used parables. He used parables to separate people. He's only here for a short time. He didn't have all the time in the world to spend on people. So what did He have to do? He had to divide the people who really wanted to know from the ones who didn't. So that He would know where to spend His time most effectively with those who chose to understand. With the first group who could see the mysteries, who could see the secrets, who was willing to open up and accept the fact that, yeah, there's a man going out here and scattering a bunch of seed, but there's a whole lot more to this than a man going out there and scattering a bunch of seed. Jesus is trying to teach us something. He's trying to explain something to us about us. You see, it's not... Well, let me illustrate it this way. If we were to take out there... The sun is shining today. Thank you, Lord. If we were to take out there to the sidewalk or maybe the blacktop parking lot and we were to lay a stick of butter out there, well, before long, you could, you could watch it run off, couldn't you? Because you know what would happen to it. How about if we were to take some wet clay out there and lay right beside the stick of butter? The butter would be running off as the clay would be hardening. Let me ask you a question. The sun is the source, isn't it? The source doesn't change. What changes is the heart of the hearer. That's what's different. It's not the source. 
In the same way, when you lay the gospel of truth on the heart and lives of people, it will melt some. It will harden others. It's the same message. It's the same gospel truth. The source is identical. The difference is the heart of the hearer. In the same way with parables. Jesus says, I'll lay this parable on you and I'll figure out what group you belong to. And I'm begging you, if you belong to the group that only sees the parable, and therefore seeing you cannot see and hearing you cannot understand, I'm begging you to desire God on a deeper, greater level than that. To be able to see and understand the secrets and the mysteries of the parable. Jesus, why? Why would you use parables? That's why. Why would we study parables? That's why. So that we can figure out which category we belong in and make sure it's the right one. If it's not this morning, we're inviting you to come to make things right, to change things, to be someone different this year than you were last year. We can help you in that. Would you come as we stand and sing?